Thank you very much, Tony, and good morning, um, everybody. Um, what I want to do is outline the events and policies, programs and strategic centres which have shaped Sydney since 1788 and how these legacies can help structure Sydney through to 2051. I will... Let's see if we can get this working. Let's go back. Um, had the Parramatta River been deeper and allowed the first fleet to sail upstream from Sydney Cove, it is very likely that Parramatta would have been declared the centre of Sydney, the main centre of Sydney. However, as the ship's keels kiss the riverbed midpoint, hence kissing point, they could not proceed upstream. As a consequence, the Royal Navy rowing their longboats were sent up the rivers to find fertile land so as to feed the colony. Not a very good slide, but um, farming land was found upstream adjacent to several rivers, thereby establishing the river cities of Windsor, Richmond, Penrith, Liverpool, Campbelltown and Parramatta, the latter being the location of the colony's first farm, a grant given to James Roos by Governor Phillip in 1789. The table here shows that in 1828, there were more people living in Western Sydney than there were in the uh, in Sydney town. 57% lived in um, uh, in the river towns, and uh, 43 in the um, in the in the C in the centre of Sydney. The nation's first railway was built between 1855 and 1864, the first stage being from Redfern to Parramatta. And I think the train was probably faster then than what I caught this morning, <laughs> um, which was incredibly slow. Why, I don't know. But then it was extended to Richmond, Penrith and Campbelltown generating the centres serving Sydney's farmlands. This rail system was primarily built to move agricultural produce to feed Sydney's residents and for export from Port Jackson. This allowed the, um, the town centre of Sydney to be founded at Port Jackson, where the wharves, warehouses and shipping offices were established. The centre was surrounded by intensive inner city housing to allow the workers to walk to their jobs, particularly to the wharves. Sydney's first inquiry into the uh, problems of the urban area was the 1909 Royal Commission into Sydney and its suburbs, which recommended that the overcrowded inner suburbs of Sydney be deconcentrated and the working classes be encouraged to live in the garden suburbs like the middle classes were living at the time. However, this necessitated bringing those workers into the city. They used to walk there. They now had to be brought there. So this required a rail network, well, the Sydney rail network, to be electrified so as to build a tunnel under the centre of Sydney and to, an un to allow that underground loop to be built there. This was achieved in the 1920s and it shifted the centre of gravity from Central Railway, where the department stores were and that's where the activity was, towards the commercial centre of Circular Quay, around Circular Quay and to the north. It was also the beginning of the suburbanisation of Sydney, encouraged by the Royal Commission to shift people out of the slums, in inverted commas, of the 
in a city. Forty eight County of Cumberland Plan, which borrowed its key principles from the 1944 London Plan, namely a green belt to contain urban growth and, count, and counter any suburban sprawl. Any growth from the London Plan was to be in new towns beyond the green belt. And this was also to alleviate slum dwellings uh, that were still left after the Luftwaffe had a go at them and um, um, anything that was left to try and um, deconcentrate a lot of London. The county plan divided the region into a series of um, districts, each with a district centre. And like London, beyond the Green Belt, and of course the, the, the westernmost uh, centre of the county of uh, Cumberland was Parramatta. The Green Belt was west of Parramatta. And there were a series of towns nominated there in case it was ever needed for population growth, just like London. And these included Penrith, Camden, Campbelltown and many others. The population projection from 1947 total of 1.7 million in Sydney was to 2.25 million by 1981. And then the county planners felt that the population growth would then plateau. The county plan also called for slum clearance, particularly of the inner terrace house suburbs, to be replaced by high rise flats sitting in open space Corbusian style, as Lucy Turnbull mentioned. The, uh, the, the dark figures are the obsolete areas to be redeveloped immediately, and that included the whole of Paddington, um, Surrey Hills, Newtown, Glebe, Erskineville, parts of Balmain. The grey areas certainly to go within 25 years, all to be uh, substituted by high-rise flats. Um, the, the Housing Commission's development at Redfern was the first of these. They're still there. They were replaced by outer area estates later on because of the unpopularity of high-rise living by the public housing tenants. In fact, Melbourne had the same problem. It took a royal commission in Melbourne to stop the high-rise public housing um, to uh, take the place of the inner suburb, suburban areas, just as well. When Sydney's, um, when Sydney's population of 2.25 million, which was supposed to be um, reached by 1961, was reached in 19, sorry, was supposed to be reached in 1981, was, re was reached 20 years earlier in 1961, a new plan was needed. The county plan did not count on massive immigration, which was uh, led by the Commonwealth, or the post-war baby boom. Therefore, a new plan had to be um, um, produced and this time uh, they also borrowed from Europe and this was the Copenhagen plan, uh, the famous finger plan, the palm being the existing urban area and the fingers were along existing railway lines where the urban growth was in, in corridors. This was the, um, this then was the 1968 Sydney Region Outline Plan and um, it showed in that table how, in actual fact, by, uh, 2000, by 1961, the population provided or um, forecast was reached 20 years earlier. The 
Sydney Rich and Alpine Plan adopted the Copenhagen model using the extensive 19th century rail network. Sydney was so uh, fortunate in having this incredible rail network started in 1855, only about 30 years after the railway was invented in, in England. And the plan was the corridors were a string of new towns along the railway line like beads on a string, each with its own town centre served by rail, forming the west, northwest, southwest. The only rail line not in place in 1968 was for the northwest sector. This was planned to be completed by 1990. However, not to worry, the construction commenced on the northwest rail in September 2014. And it's now well on the way. A key policy of the 1968 Sydney Region Outline Plan was that all future regional shopping centres or shopping malls and import from the United States, where these were almost exclusively freeway, ba freeway based, were to be at town centres served by rail as these were to be the foundation of proposed multi-use centres. This was a vital component of the Sydney Region Outline Plan's centres policy, which we are still benefiting from. I know architects don't like the idea of the shopping mall as an architectural model, but um, it has proved to be the foundation of, um, of, of the centres. The Sydney Region Outline Plan um, was to, to house five million people by the year 2000. And in actual fact, by 2001, it only reached four million. And the reason for that was that in 1968, the household occupancy rate, that's the number of people per house, was estimated to be 3.2 persons per household by, 2000, by the year 2000. In actual fact, in uh, the 2001 census, it was 2.6, which is a 20% difference. And 20% of 5 million is a million, and that's where the million disappeared to. The houses were there. The houses took all the place that the Sydney Region Outline Plan had reserved for residential development, but for only four million people. So the 1988 Metropolitan Strategy, the Sydney to its third century, had to find new areas, and they were the, um, the red areas shown there, particularly down in Picton, Bargo, and some of those areas. The um, one focus of the 1988 Metropolitan Strategy was to reinforce the centre's policy, which was highly successful, and the uh, policy was to set a target of 30% of all jobs to be in centres. The polycentric um, uh, city that Lucy Turnbull spoke about, and this target was in fact reached by in, at the census of 2011. Now, where, does, um, where is the measure of success of the census policy? The indicator is um, the accessibility to higher order jobs, which we've just heard about. Then Sydney scores very well, in my opinion. This just shows broadly, as today, where, for instance, the cross of the hospitals, where they have, uh, in fact, been located. And um, that is um, a great success story of spreading uh, health. And, and uh, Laurie Brereton in the RAND government has to take uh, the credit for that. His policy was beds to the west, and that's worked extremely well. Then we have um, another great success story was the, is the University of Western Sydney with its uh, several campuses in, uh, in Western Sydney. The main one emerging now is in, in, in Parramatta. 
and I understand that nearly 60% of all students for the University of Western Sydney come from Western Sydney, and that was always a major uh, policy. The challenge is how to continue and if, and if possible increase this level of accessibility over the next 40 years as Sydney's population heads towards 7 million by 2051. One of the biggest issues is getting, um, getting the population from the outer areas, generally low density, to these new emerging centres in the polycentric city. And um, probably one of the benchmarks of that is in Australia, and it's thought of as a world benchmark, and that is the Adelaide Obam. And what is so different and important about that is it's run by a bus system, normal bus, except it's got little wheels on it, and it picks up people in low density areas like any bus does. It then gets onto a guided track and rockets into the Adelaide CBD at 100 kilometres an hour and it gets off the track when it gets to the CBD and becomes a docile bus again serving the uh, CBD. And that is a highly successful model uh, Robert Severa, the, uh, the um, professor of uh, transport at the um, University of California, has written about it. He said this is just, um, um, just the right thing for low-density suburban areas feeding into major centres. Just a diagram of... Um, how large, just on what is emerging in this polycentric model of Sydney, and it shows Parramatta as the key centre for that red area, which is really Western Sydney, and it shows a few uh, the centres that are already in place, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about the, the future, and of course the blue area is the whole of Sydney, and there's no doubt that Sydney as the global centre will always be, always be a global centre, I think. It's not competing only with Melbourne. It also competes with Singapore, Shanghai and many world cities, as it should be. But Parramatta um, has a huge role to play and um, I think it can uh, rival Sydney over the years, not in numbers or the type but in num um, number of people working there. And in fact, I've often said, and I still think, it's my personal opinion, that the whole public service should move to Parramatta, just as much of it has already moved, like Sydney Water, the police and, and others. But that's another story. Not everybody agrees on that. And um, um, Now, just a, a bit of a league table of um, where the centres are at the moment, where, where they are standing at the moment. And under some of the uh, higher order activities, you will see there um, which ones have an administrative centre, particularly uh, council centres, um, which have hospitals, universities, shopping malls, cultural facilities, entertainment, and rail stations. And you will see the, uh, there are three that tick every box. Sydney CBD, obvious. Parramatta, yes. And interestingly enough, Campbelltown, because that was a planned centre, uh, Campbelltown, uh, um, MacArthur, a planned centre, and um, which ticks all those boxes. And the message is they're planning uh, sub-regions and their centres uh, does get results. And now to, uh, I wish to conclude by proposing a shape for Sydney by 2051 when the population, as I said, is expected to reach 7 million people, which is what London was in 2001 
And Greater London is about the same area as, the, uh, as that part of the Sydney region. So we're, we're moving to a, a big area. And when Sydney reaches 7 million, Western Sydney will have 4 million. So since um, back to 1828, when there were more people living in Western Sydney than Eastern Sydney, we'll wait till 2051 and it will revert back to that. Sydney, I suggest, should be divided into seven sub-regions. These are fairly obvious. Unfortunately, every metropolitan strategy that comes out today has a different pattern of sub-regions. To me, they're fairly obvious. Um, there's, um, let's say, in Western Sydney, let's concentrate on that. There's, um, there's the northwest, there's the southwest, and west central. Now, north, what I'm proposing here, the four million people in Western Sydney, northwest will have 1.5 million people, the same as the southwest. Northwest and each each sub-regional centre I'm proposing should serve 500,000 people. And that is enough to keep the hospitals, universities and so on. Um, um, it, and it can uh, support those. So three centres for the northwest. We have Penrith, we have Blacktown and Castle Hill. Southwest, we have Liverpool, Campbelltown, and there's the new one there, Badgewish Creek Aerotropolis. <laughs> and the new airport, and David Home will talk about new airports later, um, are not anymore just a strip and a tin shed. Uh, they are now city centres. And I think he will talk about some of these that are emerging in the world at the moment. Um, and this can be a major centre. And West Central, with a million people, I've suggested Parramatta and, of course, um, um, Sydney Olympic Park, Homebush Bay, which is also emerging as a, as a major centre. The, um, the, the East has similar, but I won't go through those. Um, the eminent uh, town planner, the late Sir Peter Hall, commented that Australia was providing some of the outstanding examples of the polycentric megacity region worldwide. And he has written books on polycentric cities. And when he was here, he, he genuinely thought um, the direction we were going was the right direction. It is this legacy of the strategic centres policy from the river cities of 1788 to that proposed at Badgeries Aerotropolis, which I think can position Sydney as the world benchmark of polycentric cities. Thank you.